In the late 19th century, there was a fiercely fought battle on the streets of New York City that eventually played a pivotal role in drawing the nation into a war on foreign soil. The battle in New York, though, was over readers and newspaper circulation between the two titans of the penny press, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Two of the nation's biggest papers epitomized the worst of journalistic practices as they stopped at nothing for their quest for dominance, even if it meant pulling the nation into a conflict they might otherwise have avoided. But could catchy headlines and sensational stories really have such consequences of blood and treasure? Well, that's the story we're here to explore. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. Joseph Pulitzer got his start in newspapers in St. Louis in 1878, running one of the most successful papers in the city before coming to New York to reach the nation's largest audience in its busiest city, a bustling hive of workers eager for the latest and breaking news of the day. His New York world became known for sensational and gripping stories that focused on crime, corruption, scandal, and disasters, not exactly the most rigorous journalistic standards for an enlightened republic. And the man who would become his nemesis and fiercest rival was at the time running a successful paper of his own in San Francisco called The Examiner. But then in 1895, Hearst went to New York to try to knock out Pulitzer and stand alone as the reigning champ of the cheap and dirty press by beating Pulitzer at his own game in his own town. But before we go any further, our exploration question for today's story lecture is, what role did the press play in America's involvement in the Spanish-American War? And what were the impacts of that war? So as we go through the story, keep focused on the press, politics, and the public. And umbrellas out, because I got some history to rain upon you first. At the turn of the century, America was at a crossroads. You see, much of America's history had been the story of the movement westward into the frontier, but by 1893, the frontier closed, meaning that there was no single line on the map that Americans had yet to cross. For this reason and many others, Americans began to look outward across the seas and began to flirt with that seductive mistress of empire. Now, there were many motivations for colonies and empire. The demand for overseas markets to sustain growth for the rising industries and farms in America. There was also a need for coaling stations for our coal-powered ships. And then there was the competition for colonies between the world's powers, mostly Europeans and a rising Japan as well. And America did not want to be left behind. And maybe most important of all was the goal to spread American culture and institutions. The belief that America had a God-given right and responsibility to spread American institutions dates back to the colonial days and is a central part of the American story. But at this time, a new idea sprang fresh from the pages of Rudyard Kipling's poetry, preached the concept of the white man's burden, that argued that the white Anglo-Saxon race had a moral responsibility to conquer and civilize and uplift the unlightened peoples of the world. Of course, the white man's burden is misleading because imperial nations were motivated more for their own benefit than genuinely uplifting others. But still yet, this idea did influence many American thinkers and played an important role in America setting its sights on many island nations, just as newspaper titans were setting their sights on Cuba for different reasons altogether. When William Randolph Hearst came to New York, he bought the New York Journal to compete with Pulitzer's New York World. Hearst doubled down on the sensational tabloid-style paper that Pulitzer himself was famous for. This became known as yellow journalism, or the yellow press, journalism based on sensational stories with exaggerated and misleading claims, all to sell more papers. And although some papers and authors have been guilty of this since pretty much forever, it reached its peak at this time during the circulation wars between the world and the Tribune. It was high tide for press propaganda that revolutionized many common practices that papers employ today, like bold, multi-headline front pages with gripping pictures or drawings. They pioneered separate sections for sports and women's issues, comics on Sundays, and relying on retail advertisers so they could sell each paper for just pennies. And in the late 1890s, events in Cuba were gaining the attention of Americans. 
Cuban rebels and freedom fighters had been fighting for decades to gain independence from Spain, and the country of Cuba had always piqued the interest of expansionist Americans. So when Spain clamped down hard on rebels who were fighting for freedom, justice, and independence, it had all the makings of a great story that could pull at the heartstrings of Americans. And if that couldn't sell papers, well, what would? It was Hearst who struck first in Cuba, believing that the heightened tensions could lead to a war that could draw on America, so he sent down two men, an artist and a reporter. Frederick Remington was a famed painter and was sent to document the hostilities in vivid images to arouse the ire of Americans against the Spanish. But according to legend, Remington found no major tensions. He grew bored and sent a cable to Hearst requesting to come home, saying, everything is quiet, there is no trouble there will be no war. I wish to return. To which Hearst cabled back, please remain. You furnish the pictures, I will furnish the war. Now, doing a story on yellow journalism, it would just be so fitting for me not to point out that this probably didn't happen and is more fiction and myth than fact, but I'd be remiss as a teacher to let it pass, even if it would make the story that much better. But there is just no real evidence that this actually happened. Still yet, the myth reveals a larger truth, and that is that Hearst was hoping for a war and would take the facts that he got and stretch and exaggerate them to the ends that he desired. And Pulitzer wasn't far behind. They both ran stories that highlighted the horrific conditions and treatment of the rebels by the Spanish. So when Spain sent the ruthless general Valerino Wellier, called the Butcher, to crush the rebels, it was perfect propaganda for the penny press. Though much was exaggerated, the Butcher can actually be credited with starting the modern civilian concentration camps, where he isolated and then literally starved out the rebels. In short time, 200,000 died of starvation and disease, and these atrocities sold papers. And if both papers were itching for a war for months, an explosion of an American warship in Havana Harbor was the scratch they needed. By the end of the century, as the frontier closed and America stood at that crossroads, European nations were busy laying claim to the world's lands and riches. This led many leaders to call on America to strap on its big boy pants and take a seat at the table of world powers. Theodore Roosevelt might have been the most popular and important proponent of this. And the belief in American nationalism combined with an expansionist foreign policy became known as jingoism. And jingos like Roosevelt would use force if necessary to expand and increase the nation's power and prestige. Against this backdrop, hostilities between Spain and the rebels in Cuba were reaching a tipping point. So America America sent down its warship, the USS Maine, to Havana as a demonstration of American power. And on February 15, 1898, an explosion ripped through the hull of the ship, burst into flames, and killed 266 Americans on board. The cause of the explosion was unclear, even to this day. However, that did not stop the yellow press frenzy from chumming the waters of war. The New York World ran pictures of the exploding ship and headlines like Main Explosion Caused by Mine or Torpedo, sure to royal Americans' blood, but Pulitzer's headlines were no match for the gripping ones of the Tribune that read, Who Destroyed the Main? Destruction of the Main was the work of an enemy. $50,000 reward! And also, the warship Main was split in two by an enemy's secret infernal machine. The rallying cry across much of the American press was, Remember the Main to hell with Spain! Later Navy investigations concluded the explosion was most likely from internal problems, but it was too late. The public was soon wrapped up in war fever, and now Americans could fight to avenge the main U.S. honor and to liberate the Cuban people from their tyrannical Spanish overlords. President McKinley, though, was more cool-headed than the public and the press and tried to work out a compromise with Spain, but it failed, and then McKinley asked Congress to authorize the use of force. He sold the war as the cause of humanity, and to show the world America was not interested in the spoils of war, Congress unanimously adopted the Teller Amendment, promising Cuban independence after defeating the Spanish. That Americans would spill their blood and spend their treasure and then simply give independence to this rich nation at its doorstep had many European imperialists shocked and in doubt. And maybe to their pleasure, this high-minded idealism later faced harsh realism when Americans feared the repercussions of complete Cuban independence and the possibility of other nations seizing Cuba for themselves. So America forced the Cuban government to put in the Platt Amendment, which allowed America some oversight over Cuban policy and granted America a naval base at Guantanamo Bay that we still hold today. 
Now, whereas most other nations clearly would have just taken Cuba and its resources directly under their wing, the Platt Amendment reveals America struggling to live up to its high ideals without completely abandoning them which is pretty much a recurring theme in American history for those keeping score. But jumping back, the war was on. It was America, a rising industrial giant against a fledging world power on its last legs. And America made quick work of chopping her down. It began with the Battle of Manila Bay in the Philippines, which was another Spanish colony who had been fighting for independence. It was one of the most successful American military campaigns ever. Within just hours, Spain's aging wooden fleet was destroyed and Spain surrendered. Then came the attack on Cuba, and it made for excellent news back home, most especially the mythical Rough Riders led by Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt had stepped down from his high office with the Navy to fight on the front lines, as he just felt he needed to get action and not miss the opportunity to serve his country and put his manhood to the test. Roosevelt was like that. The papers ate up the tales of the Rough Riders. Roosevelt on horseback, racing through Spanish bullets as he led his volunteer force and another all-black regiment up San Juan Hill. Roosevelt's heroics played right into the hands of Pulitzer and Hearst and hundreds of other newspapers across the nation. But unfortunately for the papers, it ended quickly. Quib the splendid little war with less than 400 American deaths in combat, but over 5,000 from diseases. The peace treaty that followed gave America control over the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico, and Cuba gained its independence, though somewhat limited by the Platt Amendment. The war signaled to the world America was the rising new power on the global scene, and its wings now stretched from the Atlantic across the Pacific. If the war demonstrated the power of America in the world, it also displayed the fearful power of the press and the new dangers of 20th century propaganda that would lead to horrors across the globe later Later in the century. But there was also reforms and new standards for journalism put in place in the decades after the war. Many papers and writers were aghast at the practices of the yellow press and strove to uphold themselves to better practices. Pulitzer himself seemed to account and seek redemption for his yellow sins. He donated tens of millions of dollars to Columbia University to start the world's first school of journalism that taught high standards and ethics that were absent before the war. Associations of journalists formed across the country to further those practices and standards, and the Pulitzer Prize today is recognized as the highest award in journalistic excellence. But with the rise of fake news, clickbait, and the sheer firehose of bullcrap that gushes out from the internet, social media, and even much of the mainstream press today, I think we need another renaissance of journalism to ensure that we in fact learn the lessons of history. So remember the main, and to hell with catchy phrases, seek out good trustworthy media. It's your duty as a citizen. So thanks for engaging in history today. This has been History for Humans. And hey, if you like what we do here, it'd be great if you just clicked and showed it. You can hit the bell, the whistle, the subscription button, and whatever else there is. And for teachers and homeschool parents, you can head over to my website, historyforhumans.com. That's historyforhumans.com, where I have lesson plans and resources that go with all of my units there. So you can save a lot of time, energy, and stress, and just enjoy teaching and exploring history with your students. And if you're doing a learning activity that's found on my website, hang out because I got instructions in just a sec. What happens when yellow journalism meets 21st century clickbait? Well, you're gonna get to decide and create it. This should be a great one for you guys. Relevant, creative, and a chance to throw history into the present world. So the first thing you're gonna do is read an overview to ensure that you have a good understanding of the assignment, and then view a few examples of just some amazingly terrible clickbait that I have provided. But feel free to go on the internet and explore and find some examples of your own. There's a lot of garbage out there. Then for the task, what you have to do is view actual headlines from 1898 related to the Spanish-American War. Read them closely, think about what they're saying, and then read a few more interesting facts about the case that the story's related to, and then what you need to do is turn the headline into something that's more clickbaity. You're gonna do this for three different headlines, and then you're gonna choose any one of your headlines, and then write out the opening paragraph of that story. And then lastly, you're gonna reflect and consider a few things that responsible citizens must do in order to ensure that they're reading and relying on trustworthy media and news sources, and not the clickbait trash that you just experimented with. All right, you guys got this, now rock this, and I'll catch you next time.